I'm here to talk to you about what I've learned in less than a year at Etsy. I put in a year, but that was kind of a cheat. It just sounded better. Um, I've really only been there about nine months. Uh, so, and anyway, Stephen gave everything about me in the introduction, so I'll jump straight in. Uh, what's Etsy? I mean, I think most people have heard of Etsy, although I run into a lot of people who haven't. Uh, my favorite thing I read about Etsy is that it's eBay for twee people. Um, a twee person is affectedly precious. I looked it up in the dictionary. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and so, I mean, people think about going there, people, the big joke inside Etsy is people buying feathered hair extensions. Like, this is the kind of classic Etsy item. Uh, people who do know about it is they know it as that place where you buy handmade stuff. Uh, but kind of what we really think about it as internally uh, and discuss it as is a tool to help people create small businesses. So Etsy has about three quarters of a million active sellers. Uh, and a lot of them are people who are trying to build their own business, you know, escape from the corporate drudgery or whatever it is they do. Uh, maybe they're early retirees. Who knows? There's a wide variety. Uh, but, but what it's really about is kind of empowering these people to take, you know, economic control of their own lives, build businesses, and do what they want to do for a living, which is really great. Uh, and it's super motivating. Uh, so how big is Etsy? Uh, here's a graph that I stole from someone else at Etsy's presentation. Uh, and... This, last year we did about half a billion dollars in gross merchandise sales, basically that's how much sellers sold, uh, and we have already passed that in 2012, uh, so we very well might hit a billion dollars this year uh, selling handmade and vintage stuff, which is pretty incredible, or helping people sell it. Um, so here's just the numbers that I looked up from August 2012. Uh, people sold 3.8 million items on Etsy, they added 2.4 million listings, and we served about a billion and a half page views. Uh, that, um, I looked it up, some people say we're in the top 100 US websites. Uh, basically we serve a lot of traffic, uh, a lot of dynamic web pages. Uh, what we're also known for uh, is, our, is our engineering culture. This is a cool logo that someone came up with for our engineering team. Um, and I wish I'd brought stickers. Anyway, uh, so, so, uh, so probably the key thing that we're known for in the industry is continuous deployment. Uh, we push about 30 times a day. Every developer on their first day pushes code to the live website. That's the first thing you do. You sit down, uh, you set up your laptop, you get on IRC so that you can get in the push channel, and then uh, you push your like picture to the employee directory, uh, which is pretty great because it sort of demystifies it. Like, when do you have code on the production website at most companies? Sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months. At Etsy, it's day one. So you're ready to kind of get in that mentality, write code, push it out. Um, yeah, it's scary. Like, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about kind of the scariness of it. Uh, and so the side note to this is that we graph everything. Uh, our ops people like to brag that we have 400,000 graphs or something crazy like that. Uh, Tom would be glad to know that we actually graph the power usage of all our servers, among other things. Uh, and these graphs kind of fall into four categories. So we have, um, we have like business graphs. Uh, user registrations, how many people are logging in, how much stuff are we selling, all this basic like business metrics. Uh, we graph error rates, so how many errors are people seeing on the site. We have basic uh, graphs that most ops people think about, like how much CPU are the webs using, uh, what's the load on the database servers, are hard drives filling up. Uh, and then we also have performance graphs, like how fast are the pages loading, uh, that kind of basic stuff. So one cool thing about it is that on these graphs, and you can kind of see the red lines on the edges here, uh, every time someone pushes a new red line, it's added to the graph. So as soon as you push, you get a little link, link in RC that says, go watch graphs. And then you watch the graph and you see if any of the, when your little red line is there, if you see something's off, you know, hey, time to roll back or push another fix or whatever. Uh, and it works surprisingly well. I was on call a couple of weeks ago and like a developer called me at nine at night. They were doing a kind of late push and he's like, the three arm sweater graph, which three arm sweater is Etsy's fail whale if you're on Twitter. Um, like basically the rate doubled after this push that I did and we sat down for like two hours. It turned out it wasn't what he did. It was something someone else did that was kind of obscure and making certain pages 404. Uh, but because developers are watching graphs, we're able to kind of detect these things in real time. It's the kind of insurance policy or, uh, that kind of makes continuous deployment work. Uh, another thing that we're famous for that people think we're a little bit crazy for is branching in code. So at Etsy, we only push code to the master branch. There are no developer branches. There are no feature branches. Uh, you know, in Subversion, we would just all be on trunk. Uh, and instead, what you do is if you want to write something new, if it's not finished, you just wrap it in the conditional. Uh, and when you push, you push it with the conditional as false. We have a huge config file for the site that basically lists every feature that's under development. Uh, and some stay in there forever because uh, we want to be able to turn them off in like times of high load or if we have to bring the site back up after a disaster, you know, you can, uh, you can turn things off specifically. 
Uh, so we branch in code, you put, this, you put a condition on your code when you get ready to push, and then, um, and then as you push, the configuration controls whether people see the code or not. And a couple of interesting things about this are, uh, and we, we have on and off states, obviously, but you can also push and say, this is only visible to these three people, or this is only available to Etsy employees, uh, or this is only available to a certain percentage of our users. So you can roll it out 1%, 5%, 10%, uh, and see how it scales. So you're not bringing the site down because you're pushing this new thing out. And then from a data perspective, what's interesting is we leverage that sort of being able to ramp up by percentage to do A-B testing. So once we already had this facility that says you can push something out to only 20% of people, well, we just push it out to 20%. We uh, gather metrics for a week or two, and then we, uh, and then we kind of do this A-B analysis based on that. And the actual uh, underlying uh, technology behind that's a lot more complicated, but that's the basic idea. And so this is like a, a block from a config file. Uh, and so this is a three variant test where each peop where 20 percent of the people see each of these variants and then 40 percent of the control group. So this is the kind of core of how Etsy works. Uh, just because it's interesting, Etsy is not cloud-based. Uh, we have our own servers and a data center in New Jersey. Um, I racked these. Uh, and uh, we're on the LAMP stack. So we run CentOS Linux, Apache, MySQL for most transaction processing. Uh, and PHP is our main web-facing language, uh, which is kind of funny. We have a huge team. We have a huge application. You'll think it's even more funny when you see some of the other stuff later, uh, but yeah, PHP is what we're committed to uh, completely. And we hire Ruby developers and Java developers and Clojure developers and everyone else, and then we sit them down and make them do PHP. Uh, it's kind of hilarious. Um, so what I want to talk about is what I've learned at Etsy in these nine months. and. Uh, to start out, I was one of the people, I like to read engineering blogs. I read the Etsy engineering blog uh, for all these months, and I spent about a year trying to turn the company where I worked into Etsy. I was like, we need to do more of these Etsy things. We should try them. Our release process is really slow and painful. Uh, and nobody listened to me, so I eventually quit and went to work for Etsy instead, which has been better for me for sure. I don't know if it's been better for them. Um, so yeah, so uh, the main thing I've learned at Etsy is that scaling sucks. Uh, and it's great to need to scale, right? Like everybody wants more traffic, more business, more things like that. But when I look at all the things that Etsy does to scale, what I find is that they usually come at the cost of sort of developer convenience uh, and developer productivity. So you kind of add complexity to scale or you add new processes to help scale and that moves developers further from their kind of happy place of just being able to write code. Uh, and so what this presentation is really about is like the ways that scaling sucks and what we do at Etsy to kind of mitigate that. Uh, especially that might be different from the way other people do it. Uh, so a big one is that your code will be rewritten just not all at once. Uh, and this is basically, from a software engineering standpoint, the, number, the way you scale is you find the slow things or the broken things or the things that are not standing up and you replace them with something that works better. So the key to scaling effectively is to uh, do all the things that, you know, your uh, mentors told you about, which is, you know, encapsulation, uh, loose coupling, and, uh, loose coupling and basically like don't repeat yourself so that when you have to rip out some component that's just not working you can replace it without a lot of pain. Uh, I think what not to do is to try and write code that you think will scale for the next two years today because you just don't know where it's going to break most of the time. It's always interesting where these things fail and how they fail to scale. And sort of the classic Etsy example of this is that uh, Etsy had this really weird over-engineered piece called Sprouter, which stood for Stored Procedure Router. It was a piece of Python middleware that they routed every single database call through. Uh, and like, it just wouldn't stand up as Etsy went through. And they had this problem where they're writing PHP facing code, uh, web facing code. The PHP code is talking to this Python layer. Uh, the Python layer is talking to stored procedures that they would only let the DBAs write. So from a development perspective, it didn't scale at all and it didn't scale technically. So they wound up ripping the whole thing out uh, and rewriting their own PHP based ORM uh, and also migrating from Postgres to sharded MySQL to scale horizontally. And it was like a huge effort that basically took years. Uh, and I think that if they had planned better and not tried to build this over-engineered thing in the beginning, they would have been happier. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, I think we're all familiar with, with uh, religious arguments over database. It's SQL versus NoSQL. It's MySQL versus Postgres. And the list just goes on and on. Uh, I was perhaps surprised to find when I went to Etsy is that we wind up using almost everything. We use MySQL for transaction processing. Postgres is still there for some transaction processing. Uh, we use Vertica for a data warehouse. We use HDFS for multiple applications. We use Redis for one specialized application. 
we have SQLite in the stack for certain things, and like a lot of websites, we use memcache everywhere, uh, probably in some interesting ways that are unusual, but uh, the idea of getting exercised about like picking a database or what's the des best database is a total failure for a website that's large and growing. Uh, you have to pick databases for their very specific sweet spot, uh, use them uh, to, the, you know, to the best effect, and then if you need to add a new piece of technology to kind of serve a special requirement, uh, you do so. Uh, the downside of that is that data plumbing is a black hole, and this has kind of been my life for the year. So we're setting up this new data warehouse in Vertica, and we have to get data into it from all these other data sources, and literally it's just taken an incredibly long time. Like, the amount of engineering resources we spend, uh, uh, shipping data from one data system to another, uh, the ETL and data munging uh, that, that was discussed earlier, this is, this is just a huge engineering sink, and we have some of our smartest engineers work on it. Um, and it's just, it's just a huge commitment. Um, so this is another thing that I think people would be surprised about Etsy. Uh, basic, the, basically the most common way you think about Twitter, many other uh, large organizations, is that you scale your organization by splitting people up into teams. Uh, they know they have a special piece of the kind of overall stack that they work on, and then they, uh, and so, and then they basically have like their code that they work on and a set of well-defined interfaces that they use uh, and deal with other, and expose to other teams. So it's almost like working with AWS or anything else, you know. Uh, in fact, Steve Yege made like this huge splash when he said, Google should be more like Amazon. Amazon, Google's like all this, you know, unified big stack. Amazon, they split everything up into these services. The services eventually turn to products. Like this is the right way. We do it the wrong way. They're better than us at that. Uh, and what's interesting about Etsy is that uh, like, as a specific explicit decision, like there's just this total rejection of silos, total rejection of the even concept of, of using internal services for things. There are some web services internally, but by and large, this sort of service-oriented approach doesn't work for Etsy. Uh, it works for many other companies. I don't, and indeed, when I went to Etsy, I thought this is the way to do it. You split things up into services and they're well-defined. Uh, so it's, very, it's been kind of an interesting cultural shift to see the opposite there. Uh, so, for example, at Etsy, we check all of our code into this one big repository, again, only into the master branch. It includes both the internal and external web-facing apps, and when you push the deploy button, you deploy every piece of code on the website. Well, I mean, it, it's a diff. You don't actually deploy every single file, but, uh, but basically, this is it, you know? So the great thing about it is that I can take an engineer that's working on internal apps today and say, hey, we need you to help with seller tools tomorrow, and they can start go in there and start getting the job done, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, during Hack Week, people work on things all over the website all the time, and there's almost no ramp up because everybody's used to this whole stack. Uh, you know, the downside I would have assumed is like mass confusion, people not really understanding how everything works, you know, uh, why do people build services? It's so much easier to sort of work in your little compartment. But really, I've found the costs, uh, maybe I've just drunk the Kool-Aid, but like, I don't see the kind of costs of, of this, I don't know if they call it big ball of mud approach. Um, the, another thing that, that we do at Etsy that I think serves us well uh, is that we define production services really broadly. So everybody knows that the website is a production service, but beyond that, uh, our entire deployment and uh, graphing chain is a, treated as a production service as well. It's a, it's a P1 issue if people cannot push new code. Uh, you know, being able to push code immediately uh, you know, enables us to fix problems that people see on the website, enables us to address security flaws, and uh, it's a drop in everything and fix it problem uh, if people can't push code just as it is if the actual website is down, which is kind of a big deal. Same for internal apps. If support can't do their work, then we, uh, then it's a P1 issue and, uh, and we treat it as such. Uh, this is a big one uh, that I kind of knew about before I went to Etsy, but you can really see it at a company that's growing fast. Uh, I call it the why wasn't I consulted list after this blog post that Paul Ford wrote about internet as a why wasn't I consulted medium or whatever. Uh, and this is probably the number one area, aside from pure technology, why scaling is difficult and painful and kind of sucks for developers. If I'm sitting at my desk one day and I say, I have this awesome new feature for the website, it's going to guarantee you it's going to show buyers things they really want, they're going to want to buy it today, and uh, you know, let's write it and push it out. Well, then the first question becomes, who on this list of groups at Etsy do I have to talk to to push this thing out? And that's true, groups at Google, groups at Amazon, groups anywhere. Do I need to talk to security? Am I exposing a security hole? Do I need to talk to ops? Is it going to make the website crash over the holidays? Uh, 
Do we have graphs? Do we have the graphs that Opsa wants to show that it's really working? Uh, you need to talk to my team, the analytics team, and say, hey, are we actually instrumenting this thing so we can figure out whether it's doing what you think it's gonna do? Is it increasing conversion rate? That's what we care about. Uh, internal apps, do we need to add features to the customer support application so that when people email questions about this thing, there are actually answers to them uh, and they can look at how it's being used. We have Etsy's translated into multiple languages. Did you build it in such a way that we can push these translations? Uh, and, and so what we find is that, is that without why, you know, this why wasn't I consulted list is the number one kind of issue for developer convenience. You can't just write things and push them out the door. Uh, although at Etsy you actually can, which I will talk about. Uh, and so the other side of that I think is that procrastination is okay sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to building scaling features on your website. Like sort of the thing that motivated me to do this whole presentation was I looked at some of the things we've done to scale, which were absolutely necessary and we wouldn't make it through the holidays without them. And I said, boy, I wouldn't want to do those things unless I absolutely needed them because they were so painful. And I'll use uh, a sort of not really a scaling issue, but a customer driven issue at my old job to talk about this. So we had all this private customer information and we had customers who really want us to encrypt all of this information in our database uh, all the time. And so uh, we, put this off forever and it was the right thing to do. We procrastinated, procrastinated, procrastinated because we knew two things. One of which was it was gonna be hard to write this thing so that it worked well and smoothly. And the other was that as soon as this feature went live, this encryption, uh, the ability to sort of go in and, and like just look things up, diagnose problems that customers were having, all this other stuff went away because you couldn't just go in and decrypt it. Uh, it was, became very difficult to write reports. Uh, and this sort of list goes on and on with that, so, with that sort of thing. And it's the same thing with some scaling features. Like, uh, as soon as they go live, they impose a cost on developer productivity forever from that point. So you don't want to be, you know, preemptively scaling knowing that it, it, it hurts the ability to build features uh, that customers want and basically help you do better with your business. Um, and, and again, the, and to another side, the trap is that scaling is an interesting problem, right? Like I think everyone who's doing web development, I mean, one of the reasons I went to Etsy was, hey, I want to work on a big website, work on the big scaling problems. Uh, you know, this is kind of, you know, how do you get invited to give keynotes at Velocity? You took a website from no people to millions of people. This is, you know, the Instagram case. Everybody wants to be there with this explosive growth. Uh, and I think there's a real temptation among engineers to go off and they read blogs like Code is Craft, Etsy is part of the problem, I suppose, uh, or, Facebook's, or Facebook's blog and say, oh man, this is what we need to be doing. This like scaling technique that they built was super cool. Uh, and A, if you're not really suffering the pain, you probably don't need it yet. And B, the solution to Etsy's problems where we have a five year legacy of PHP code and all these other things very well might not be the solution to your problems. Uh, so, so as cool as scaling is and as fun as it is, uh, given the cost, it's just, it's not worth doing preemptively. Um, this is probably the most popular tweet I ever wrote, which is programming is to software engineering as sex is to save sex. Uh, and when I wrote it, what I was thinking about is, you know, you have 100 developers and they're all committing to the same code base. If you don't have lots of protection, people are gonna get a disease, right? Like, the website's going down, that's why we have continuous integration, this is why we have all these other kinds of uh, precautions, graphs, and all these things. Uh, and safe sex, right? Uh, this is what makes it all work. Um, but the response I got from people, many, many people on Twitter was, that's right, programming is to software engineering is sex, it's a safe sex, it's not useful if you wanna create anything. Uh, which, which really made me, which really is true, right? I mean, again, you go back to the why, why design consulted list or these scaling features or, you know, sharded my sequel and on and on, like, all these things get in the way of just sitting down and writing new features. Uh, so, so I think this is the balance that we try to strike uh, in any org engineering organization. How do you, you know, have the software engineering approach, safe sex, uh, but still actually get things done? Uh, and at Etsy, continuous deployment is in fact the solution to this problem. So like if I have this awesome creative new idea, uh, I can, you know, start coding it up, I can check it into the master branch, I have it turned off on production, uh, we, and it pushes to the live site in what we call a dark push, uh, and then like everyone else can look at it on their VM, I can start showing it to other people, I can start building it out. Uh, if we're ready to use it with production data, I can launch it in admin only mode so that only Etsy employees can see it. So there's a way for people to sort of exercise this creative muscle and build things uh, and try them out without, uh, going through all this what was I, why was I consulted list business or anything else, uh, which is fantastic. And so 
at my old job, what I oftentimes found was that as a software developer, I was waiting. I was waiting for us to do requirements for the next release, or I was waiting for the QA people to estimate uh, what we would get done, or then we're in the testing phase, and we're not building things for the next phase because people are testing. And it's like, geez, you know, I'd really like to be fixing bugs, or writing new features, or doing some stuff that's actually useful instead of sort of sitting around and waiting. Um, and we just didn't... And, we just didn't have the opportunity to do that because of the way it was. I mean, it got to a point at this job, even though we had like 20 to, or 25 people, uh, you had to get approval from QA to fix bugs that we knew were broken. We had hundreds of unfixed bugs in the thing. And like at Etsy, where we have continuous deployment, that just would not happen. You would fix the bug, you would write a unit test that shows that the bug is fixed, you run it through our continuous integration server, and then you push that thing out. Like you don't need anyone's permission to do that. Uh, and it's how we kind of maintain velocity even as we scale pretty rapidly. Uh, and the other thing that I've kind of learned at Etsy is that scaling the organization is the toughest challenge because uh, just the whole concept of like getting enough developer resumes in, interviewing these people, picking the ones that are actually worth hiring, uh, and then getting them on board and productive turns out to be just a ton of work. Uh, and then there's also the issue at a rapidly growing organization is Etsy has a really strongly defined engineering culture. Uh, and, uh, and how do we kind of disseminate this culture and get people who come in not to try and change the good things about Etsy? Uh, this sort of scaling is just as hard as like, how do we push 1,500 transactions per second through Memcache or whatever else, although Memcache is a big pain in the ass. Um, uh, so, so like this, this scaling of the organization is something we're always dealing with. And in this sense, like having an engineering blog really helps because most people who come to Etsy when they interview, it's like, have you read Coda's craft? Yes. You know, in fact, that's why I applied. Boom, they're already kind of bought into the system. So, if, so uh, as a recruiting tool and as a sort of like way to spread your engineering culture, uh, an engineering blog is fantastic, even though it tempts people to do things they probably shouldn't do at their own jobs. Um, so kind of the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of naturalistic programming, which is a term that uh, I stole from a guy who used to work at Etsy named Noah Sussman. Uh, and he describes naturalistic programming as the programming you do uh, when you're starting a brand new thing, you have an empty editor window, you can pick any language you want, you can use the editor you want, uh, you know, and you're just going at it. Like, this is the maximum kind of creative sweet spot for an engineer, greenfield development, right? Uh, and the challenge for us at Etsy and for everyone who's trying to build an engineering organization is to kind of keep developers as close to the state of naturalistic programming as you, as you possibly can. Like, uh, the further they feel from just this sort of free to write the code that they want to write uh, that's interesting, the harder it is to, for people to be productive, the less happy they are in their jobs. Uh, and as a, as a kind of side note to this, what I would also say is that uh, the other trick is that you need to kind of bring in practices uh, that engineers will kind of bring into their own naturalistic programming style. Like the ideal engineering practices to add are the ones that people say, oh, hey, this is such a great idea that if I were quitting tomorrow and starting my own company, I would be doing this exactly the same thing. Uh, and to me, like the kind of classic example here uh, is test-driven development. So test-driven development from a long distance looks like something that um, some corporate asshole would impose on you and make you do. Write tests for all your code as you write it. Like, this looks stupid, right? Uh, you write twice as much code, it also all has to be maintained. Uh, but people find that when they try it, or at least a lot of people, uh, that A, it doesn't take them any longer to get their code done, B, they can kind of build their code in a more fundamentally sound way because they kind of start from the inside and work their way up. They don't iterate on testing things in the browser over and over and over. They're testing a, a, you know, a tighter loop of testing. Uh, so it's a thing that, that seemed like a bad idea, turns out to be a good idea, and now many people uh, just do it even if they're, like when I do the homework for the Scala class I'm taking online, I do a TDD approach on it just because that's kind of how I think now. Uh, and so when you're adding engineering practices, you're advocating in their organization, they, you should try and make them pass that test. Like, uh, would people do this on their own even if no one made them do it? Yes, then it's probably a good thing to add. If not, if they, think, if they all think it's really stupid, then it uh, applies to, yeah, it makes them unhappy. Uh, and so basically that's it for me. You know, uh, scaling sucks, but it doesn't have to suck as badly uh, as it might. <laughs>